Yo, Jonathan here. This has been in the works for months. It is without a doubt the most work that's gone into a setup, but conversely, it is the one that I am most proud of by far. This is a 714 Dolby Atmos ready workspace geared for both audio and video production. And what that breaks down to is 11 speakers, one giant sub, two displays, a mic preamp, audio interface, MIDI keyboard, all powered off a 14 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro. And you kind of got to hear the space to believe it. What the? Crazy, yeah. huh? Yeah. I mean, dude, this is like, I mean, I, I like, I want this in my house. When I honed in front and center, she was like right here singing to me and then everything was sort of filling in behind it. I love when you hear it go like and then, oh, that's sick. There was one part of the song where like, they, it was like almost like a, like a, a sweep, like from this side to that side. Bro, what? I was definitely feeling a little skeptical, but it really did feel like maybe the most enjoyable musical experience, like listening to things. It felt euphoric. Yeah. So I have to admit, twice it gave me goosebumps. <laughs> God, I have never heard sound like that ever. But them guitars, especially when it dropped in and her vocals came to the side there, mm -hmm. and then it went back to the front and then straight oh. from the back to the front, bro, that was, that was crazy. It literally feels like you're like in the middle of a band performing to you. I don't know, I feel like that might've even been the best Atmos music. When the chorus dropped, yeah, that chorus. like ever. So let's break down 714 in its simplest form. Seven represents the number of surround speakers, all of which are ear level. So you have left, right, center, left side surround, right side surround, and then both of the rear surrounds. One represents the sub or LFB, and then four represents the height channels, which to me is what makes Atmos special because not only are you moving sound left to right or front to back, but you're also moving sound up and down. As far as the speaker configuration, these are all powered monitors from Genelec. And fun fact, there is an iconic photo of Steve Jobs at his home setup using Genelec. Got a little bit of a mix and match going for mine with the left center rights being the 8341As, AKA the ones which are incredible, incredible monitors. For the four surrounds and the four height monitors, those are the 8330As and a limited raw finish, which are actually unfinished. So this is what it looks like before it's finished and coated, which aesthetically I think looks really nice, but also gives you an inside look of the build quality of the monitors because these are solid aluminum. As far as that massive sub, which is usually what catches people's attention when they walk into the space, that is the 7370A, which is a 12 inch subwoofer and is disgusting in the best possible way. This is all running through the Apogee Symphony IO Mark II, which to me is arguably the best interface you can get for Atmos. It actually just got a huge update tailored specifically for Dolby Atmos, where you can quickly swap between not only monitor configurations, but also monitor sets. So you could go from 714 to stereo, and that'll mute the speakers you're not using, which is incredibly helpful. But let's say you had a pair of NS10s, some cubes, or just an alternate pair of reference monitors altogether. That is where monitor sets come into play, and you can configure and swap between up to three different sets. This one specifically having 16 ins and 16 outs, enough to run Atmos off a single interface is what initially compelled me to look at it, but then you combine Apogee's sound quality, their converters, with how easy it was to set up, especially when paired with the Genelex, and it kind of feels like it shouldn't have been that simple. So M1 Max MacBook Pro connects to the Symphony IO Mark II via Thunderbolt. Outputs one through eight on the Symphony are first fed to the subwoofer, which acts as a crossover and handles bass management for the seven surround speakers, and also doubles as an input for the LFE channel. Outputs nine, 10, 11, and 12 are then connected straight to the height speakers, and these are all running at full range since they're not passing through the sub. Now, part of what makes this setup so powerful is that every single one of these monitors are part of Genelec's Smart Active Monitor lineup, AKA SAM, and this works in tandem with their GLM software, which is really where the magic happens. If we hop in the DeLorean and rewind back to the pre-cable management days where things kind of look like the upside down, everything starts at the GLM box, that goes to the sub, the sub goes here, to there, to there, from there to there, to there, back here, to there, up to this top left to there, around to the back, and then it's full final form. Once everything is connected, there is then a GLM reference microphone that analyzes the entire room. Whoosh. 
This then optimizes each monitor for level, distance delay, which is especially important in a multi-monitor Atmos setup, the subwoofer crossover phase, and even the room response EQ. So in our case, while the acoustic treatment we added makes a huge difference, the space isn't perfect, and this helps ensure the most accurate and tuned listening experience possible. What kind of blew my mind though, is in the latest version of GLM, it'll generate a great report of your room, which is shockingly detailed and extremely helpful in making improvements or tweaks to your setup. It also introduces MIDI control, which enables you to set it up with something like a Stream Deck and gives you a physical tactile way to control things. So if you are in a multi-monitor setup, you can easily swap between monitor groups. So from stereo to Atmos, for example, you can toggle bass management on or off, control different volume presets, or mute the entire system altogether. So alongside the interface, the monitors, the other crucial part to this setup is the room. This space is kind of a room within a room, which we were able to accomplish with 13 freestanding movable acoustic panels. This gave us the most flexibility. One, we didn't have to treat the entire space and two, we can break it down if we ever needed to. There are then four ceiling clouds, wall treatment above and below the TV. And these are all from GM Acoustic Design who were incredible to work with. They make some really, really beautiful acoustic treatment and I cannot recommend them enough. I'll have a link to where you can check them out, their different designs, and then exact specifications and measurements of what we're using down below. Now the ceiling was honestly the most challenging part of the process. Here's what everything looked like before. Luckily, Genelec also makes some incredible first party mounts, so mounting the speakers was fairly simple. The cabling and the wiring though, not so much. This is an early iteration where we had cables running up the wall to the second floor and then back around and down to the speakers along with the power, and it worked. Things turned on, sound came out, but it just was not it. Fortunately, we got in touch with an electric company who did an incredible job. Shout out to Brian at 24-7 Electric. Not only were they able to run all of the cabling and wiring through the ceiling, they were able to add independent power sections to each monitor, which was huge. To take things over the top, they were then able to create custom power cables for each of the monitors, so there was no excess power cable to deal with or hanging off, just pure clean perfection. The couch is from Lovesack, and not gonna lie, I kinda used to sleep on them because of the name, but it is exceptionally comfortable and worked out great for the space. Now, because ball is life, there are quite a bit of basketball-related things in this room, most of which are from Market. The carpet was something we grabbed randomly from Target, and the desk is the platform by output, which is probably my favorite music-focused desk for the money. There's a top shelf with plenty of rack space below that divided into three different sections, a ton of cable management options and a pullout tray which you can use to house a synth or MIDI keyboard. The MIDI controller we're using is the Complete Control S49 in a limited retro finish. They still make the keyboard, but sadly this finish has been discontinued. Just above the Symphony I.O. is the Shelfer channel from Neve, which to me is like the Michael Jordan of channel strips. It's essentially like a 1073 on steroids, so you have your pre, EQ, compression, but where it shines is the silk, blue and red, which is just about the most beautiful tape saturation you could imagine. We've used it on guitar, bass, piano, vocals, really just about everything. So the center channel is housed on top of the desk, and if this were just stereo left and right, you could easily fit both on top of the desk without needing to use any external stands. In this case, because we do need that extra space, the left and right channel are housed on monitor stands from Ultimate Support, and these are also what we're using for the side surrounds and rear surrounds as well. The TV is the Sony A90J, which is just a beautiful, beautiful TV, especially if you're into HDR or Dolby Vision. Now for the monitor and the main display, which I've got a ton of questions about, that is the LG Ultrafine 4K. Honestly, if you're on Mac looking for an external display, this is what I would recommend first. It's super bright at 500 nits, incredible color, and you're getting dual Thunderbolt ports on the back with an additional three USB 3 ports. Now in my case, I have it set up at an angle, which A, I really enjoy in a music-based environment, and B, it allows for clearance on that center channel, and that's huge because it allows the left, center, right channels to all remain at a uniform height. We were able to do this through a modified VESA mount arm that we flipped upside down and pushed through that middle rack space. And that middle rack is kind of like the secret chamber because there is a lot going on behind the scenes. So behind the Ultrafine is a power conditioner, but there's also a Thunderbolt dock from OWC, which is kind of the hidden MVP of this setup. So the Symphony IO, the interface that connects to every single one of those speakers, both displays, the MIDI keyboard, that is all connected through the dock and through one cable that then connects to the MacBook Pro. Now in front of the MacBook Pro is a headphone amp from Little Labs. This is the Monitor. 
Don't get me wrong, the Symphony I.O. has an incredible headphone amp, but for me, this does two things. One, it puts it in a better location off to the left, which to me is much more comfortable. Two, which is most important to me, it adds a second headphone out. So if you're working with somebody and you're cutting vocals or an instrument, this is immensely useful. And the headphones that I'm using are the Bear Dynamic DT 1990 Pros, which I absolutely love. So how the heck do you listen to or even work in Dolby Atmos? There are absolutely more complex setups than this. You can do it in Pro Tools or in Nuendo. In my case, I'm doing it in Logic Pro. The fact that Apple included the Dolby renderer into Logic Pro at no additional charge to me speaks volumes to where this format is headed. And then really for me, what I think is the secret weapon with Logic Pro is the spatial audio headphone renderer that is also now built in. So I am 100% using every single one of these speakers to mix. It is crucial, but another crucial element is that it has to translate to headphones and maybe even more importantly to AirPods because of Apple Music. For me, once I started using the Apple renderer as the headphone reference and then implementing AirPods to check a mix, in addition to the speakers, that's where I really started to notice a difference where it would translate both to speakers and to headphones. So to get an idea of what it's gonna sound like before it goes live on Apple Music, to get a feel of what spatial audio and head tracking feels like ahead of time, to me, that's a game changer. And again, the most important thing here is that you're getting the best of both worlds. Obviously, headphones are not going to recreate or really come close to this setup, but it's surprising how immersive you can get things on a pair of AirPods. And I think it's only gonna get better and better fast. Now, while I mix in Logic Pro, I'll usually reference the final mix in the Dolby Atmos renderer. One, it's just a simple, quick way to load an ADM WAV file, which is the format for Dolby Atmos. And two, for me, honestly, it's just a foolproof way to make sure I did not screw anything up so you can quickly see if all the channels are lit up. It's a secondary place to play things back and make sure they're in the correct location. And then finally, I'll just use it to triple check to make sure I'm within the loudness spec before I deliver the Dolby Atmos file. There is one more element to the setup, which is the Marantz receiver below the desk, which is connected to an Apple TV. So the Apple TV is going HDMI out to the Marantz, which then has XLR out to the Symphony IO, which is ultimately going back to the monitors. Honestly, because the monitors are powered and don't need an amp, the Marantz is really just acting as a glorified Atmos decoder right now. So we use it to play back spatial and Dolby Atmos mixes on Apple Music, which also extends to TV and movies. Luckily though, there was an update recently in macOS that supports Dolby Atmos and 714 playback natively. I haven't personally been able to get it to work perfectly. Currently, Apple Music is only outputting 5.1. Hopefully that is fixed within the next update because it also should apply to TV shows and movies. And if that's the case, I wouldn't need the Marantz at all. Recently, I got a chance to mix Julia Wolf's newest single in Atmos, and this was done through Logic Pro. One of the coolest elements of the tracks in Atmos are the whispers, which kind of move around and behind you. There is then a cowbell, which is not only physically moved up above you, but it's also rotating in 3D space. Wildly enough, that track actually ended up on Apple's best pop spatial mixes, which is crazy. Now, when we set out to build this, I don't think mixing in Atmos, at least at a high level, was something that I expected myself to do. So it's been kind of a wild ride. And ultimately, I think it's a combination of one, falling in love with the format, two, being around some incredibly talented people, and three, not that it's easy to mix in Atmos by any means, but the combination of Apogee and Genelec and Logic Pro, that made it easy to get into, and ultimately is what has allowed me to do it every single day. That's great. It's just so much. It's crazy, huh? Yeah. I love that. That's a, that's a no, I mean, it's just a no brainer. And the way that you can fill in the back too. Yeah. I mean like. And the tops, the top. The thing. top, the back. Yeah. That's this section right here. Yeah. That was, that was special. Yeah. Yeah. Recently got a chance to have Fly By Midnight over, who are one of my favorite groups, and was fortunate enough to mix their next single in Atmos, which I am super excited for. I also got a chance to mix for Asher Postman, the stuff that I released with Nico, and Love You To Death, which is the most recent track that I did with Loot. It's impossible not to think back to last year when Apple dropped the Apple Music update alongside Lossus. They also dropped Spatial Audio and Dolby Atmos, and ultimately, 
recently, that is what changed everything for me. I was so intrigued, I immediately just looked up everything I possibly could on mixing music in Atmos and ultimately ended up on the Produce Like a Pro channel with a video on Dave Voy. The second that he explained and showed that you can move music in 3D space, I was sold and I knew immediately I had to hear what that sounded like. Shortly thereafter, I was fortunate enough to get a chance to meet and work with Dave and ultimately hear what actual Atmos music sounded like in his studio and it was game over. I was familiar with Atmos through movies and theaters and cinema, but music, it just hit different. And from that point, I knew not only that I wanna consume music that way, but I wanted to make music that way. For those that have watched the channel throughout the years, I think you've seen the obvious step back and push towards music because as much as I love tech and as much as I love video, and believe me, I love video, music is by far my favorite thing. And throughout the last few years, I think some of those music-based tech focused videos were some of my favorite projects ever. With that, getting a chance to work with these incredibly talented individuals, Jackson and Emma from Loot, Andrew Dawson, Julia Wolf, that was inspiring to me. But I think from the outside, there's a lot of people who kind of looked at me as this tech guy who really liked music. We're not sure why he likes music, but he does. And with that and a combination of the pandemic, I just took it upon myself to work my ass off at guitar, at music, so at some point I could be in the same room with these guys. Fast forward to releasing a track with Julia, MagSafe. Still doesn't make sense to me to this day, to now getting a chance to work with, to co-write, to release a track with Loot is a freaking dream come true. Startup, which was based off the Windows XP boot up sound, that was my first computer that got me into music, into video editing. That is rapidly approaching 2 million streams, which is just wild. Rewinding back to the when we were writing and creating the track, ahead of time, I knew I wanted this to be in Dolby Atmos. So we called up Dave Way, who ends up mixing Startup in Atmos. And to see that go from inception to completion, and then all of a sudden being finished in Atmos at his studio was such a surreal experience. And ultimately, the entire reason why all of this exists. I wanted that experience all the time. And it wasn't like I could show up on a Tuesday and be like, hey Dave, can I borrow your Atmos system? The dude is busy doing Atmos mixes. So ultimately, we ended up trying to build our own. By far, my favorite thing about this space is when someone comes over and listens and experiences for the first time. It's one thing to describe it, but when you're in here and you hear it and you feel it and you see that smile or that moment of disbelief or the, yo, what was that? It's almost like Disneyland or as cheesy as it sounds, like magic is real for that second that you're in the seat listening and just absorbing it. Music, it will make you happy, it will make you sad, it will take your mind places that maybe you didn't realize you would go. We ended up doing a stripped version of Startup where weirdly, my inspiration for that was Metallica and the SM orchestral performances they've done, where I wanted to take that, strip everything back, do an orchestral arrangement, get all of our friends and do kind of this choir which surrounds you in the sound. The only reason that version exists is because we wanted to do it in Atmos. So the idea of not just mixing or even writing for Atmos, but arranging and composing, that's what's really exciting for me. So again, to take this idea and then turn it into reality and then have someone get a chance to sit back, listen, absorb it, and then get moved by it, like you can't ask for anything better. Two of the wildest, most meaningful moments of this entire Atmos journey was one, getting to send that finished startup script back to Genelec and they recorded themselves listening to it. Shout out to Paul and Will. At one point I thought they were trolling me because they whipped out Kleenex and I was like, oh, these guys. And then to see actual tears, like it brought tears to me, you know? And to go full circle and dive back a little deeper into music and it being so important to me, the reason why I hadn't played in years, and if you go back many years ago, there's a dark video on the interwebs, me looking like I should be in Smash Mouth playing metal guitar. Really the reason I stopped was because when I was 18, I lost my dad and he was ultimately the reason why I played guitar. After I lost him, 
it was never the same. I wanted to turn to it to feel better and ultimately just felt worse. And I think as you grow up and kind of grow apart from it and you become an adult and you have responsibilities and then video takes off, I kind of just always had music off in the distance, but never really wanting to let go. So part of that motivation after the pandemic was again to work really hard at music and to come full circle probably the most gratifying moment was getting a chance to show my guy Preezy and his son Atmos. Because there's moments, man, where you kind of just look up and you want to show your dad this stuff because you know how much he'd appreciate it. And at some point, just watching him and his son get a chance to experience this together, it was like gut-wrenching, but also wildly beautiful at the same time because in some full circle way, my dad getting me into music is what led to that moment where a father gets to share that with his son. And that's just wild. So that's the video, that's the tour. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did and you are feeling like being awesome, make sure you guys drop a like down below. I'll have a link to all the music in Spatial and Dolby Atmos in a playlist in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is Jonathan and I will catch you guys later. You ever watched a conductor, you know, you know, conduct the, the whole orchestra. It's like you're sitting right right there. It's like everything is right there. Like you're in the middle of an orchestra, like in the circle of it. And it's just, you're surrounded by all of that. And I think that's like, yeah, for me as a producer, composer, that's like, that's all you ever want, <laughs> is to hear it like that. Slow to start up, but I'm in from day one I don't know a lot, but I know about us I don't know a lot, but I know I love you Like we're gonna die